gentlemen thank you all for being here for being kind of squished in and squeezed in it's a testimony to the importance of this topic and to our speaker that you are all here tonight so thank you for being here um, after tonight the International Affairs Forum will be taking a break uh, for December and January we return on February 1st with our academic world quest competition for area high school students and we're very excited about that this year it will be our fifth year and then um, our programs resume in February, always on the third Thursday of the month here at Milliken. Just before I started, you saw our lineup, uh, which I'm really, really pleased with. I think it's one of the best we've had. Um, in February, we're starting with US-China trade with Jim Levinson, who uh, is a professor at Yale. Um, in March, we're going to be looking at the Rohingya uh, refugee crisis with uh, Sarah Curran and possibly a um, uh, surprise um, uh, speaker coming in by, by Skype. In April, we'll address a very important topic of Iran with somebody who knows the topic very well, uh, Reza Marashi. And in May, we're uh, doing something pretty extraordinary and ambitious for the International Affairs Forum. We will be bringing back Professor Gandhi. Uh, some of you may have heard him speak here to a sold out crowd a number of years ago. And in addition to Professor Gandhi, um, assuming he gets a visa, we're bringing a professor from Pakistan, the Pashtun area of Pakistan, who was held hostage by the Taliban for four years, released in, uh, released in 2012, and and what binds those two gentlemen together is that their grandfathers um, in the 1920s, a gener two generations ago, were working for peace in Pakistan and India. Of course, it wasn't Pakistan at the time, but Ghaffar Khan uh, was known as the Pashtun Gandhi. And then, of course, you are all very familiar with, um, with Gandhi uh, in India. And so the idea that we could bring those two people here, have them on stage, and talk about the legacy of that struggle for peace is going to be really extraordinary. And then finally, in June, we will conclude uh, this season with uh, the program on Mexico that we had tried to do in September, just before, um, just after the Mexico uh, earthquake. And now, before it was going to be Alfredo Corchado, and we're very fortunate that now he's going to come with his partner, uh, uh, Angela uh, Kachergo, who is a Ukrainian-Mexican journalist. Both of them are experts on uh, living on the border, uh, El Paso, uh, on the other side, and it will be a true uh, extraordinary evening to uh, hear their views. So tonight, we are so pleased to welcome back Ambassador John Byerly. Four years ago, John uh, gave an outstanding presentation about U.S.-Russia relations, also to a sold-out audience. And I recently re-watched that presentation, and I couldn't help but be struck by the differences between that presentation and what I believe we're going to be discussing tonight. Then, even though there were troubling signs on the horizon, Ambassador Byerly described the U.S.-Russia relationship in pretty normal terms. Yes, areas of disagreement, but there were also overarching mutual interests and a long history of working together pragmatically. Putin, by name, really was only mentioned a few times. Today, in contrast, we can't seem to get beyond Putin. He dominates in every sense of the word. And instead of a broad, multifaceted relationship, these days, certainly in the media, it seems that it all comes down to that one person. So we are incredibly fortunate to have John back to help us understand uh, this very important relationship. John is one of America's top experts on Russia, and we are particularly proud that he is a Michigander. Uh, he started studying Russian at Grand Valley State in the 1970s, and he credits an overseas program uh, offered by NMC here as the first time that he really became turned on to foreign affairs and his lifelong interest. Um, his interest in Russia was um, almost certainly sparked also by his father, 
who, um, I don't know how many of you have heard this story, but after escaping from a Nazi prison camp in early 1945, Joe Byerly managed to convince a Soviet tank battalion to allow them to fight with them on their way to Berlin. And so there's a lot more to that story, and I think in Q&A it would be great if we could hear John describe that, because particularly for the students and the younger people in this audience, um, it's really important to remember the times that our two countries were able to work together. Uh, John joined the State Department as a diplomat in 1983, just in time to witness the fall of the Soviet Union and the extremely difficult and exciting transition to something else, arguably a transition that is still ongoing. His talent was unmistakable at the State Department. He would be appointed twice as ambassador to Bulgaria from 2005 to 2008 and to Russia 2008 to 2012. During that time, he led the reset in U.S.-Russian relations, highlighted by the signing of the START II Nuclear Arms Reduction Treaty. Russia finally joined the World Trade Organization after years and years of negotiations, and he also witnessed even joint Russian-U.S. military exercises. So he was honored with top awards by both Republican and Democrat Democratic administrations before he retired from the State Department in July 2012 with the rank of career minister, the diplomatic equivalent of a three-star general. He remains very active and extremely well connected with uh, diplomats and the State Department. Um, and maybe that's one of the things we can uh, have him talk about also in, in Q&A, his impressions of, of what is happening with the State Department. He mentioned uh, to me earlier uh, this evening that this year he traveled with five other ambassadors and then they all went up Kilimanjaro together. So imagine that. So, uh, With no further ado, please join me in welcoming Ambassador John Byerly. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Karen, for that, uh, for that warm introduction on a rather cold night. I am uh, very happy to see so many people here tonight on a, on a cold Traverse City evening. When I was here, uh, Gee, when was it, four years ago, five years ago? I think it was also kind of a cold night, but uh, it doesn't seem to deter people. Uh, being a kid from Muskegon, I understand these things. Uh, I want to recognize uh, some special guests in the audience tonight, and that is my sister, uh, Julie Sugars, uh, my brother-in-law, Jack Sugars, and their son, Eric Sugars. Eric is the head coach at Traverse City Central Football, so I'd like to congratulate him and the school on another winning season and another trip to the playoffs and an absolutely epic game uh, a couple of Fridays ago against TC West, and congratulations to TC West as well. Uh, I follow Traverse City High School football very, very closely. You will be surprised or maybe not surprised to know. Uh, I'm also flattered uh, to look down and see my sister here. Uh, anytime my sister travels, and she drove up from Muskegon today voluntarily to hear me speak is, is quite a thing, because <laughs> obviously for many years she was an involuntary listener to me speaking. But I love her dearly and I'm very happy to see her here. And I'm not happy, or I'm not unhappy, to see such a big turnout for Russia. I am not unhappy about that at all, and it's not surprising. As Karen was saying, relations between Russia and the United States are among the most critical relations between any two countries on the face of the earth. They remain vitally important, obviously, to us in the United States and to Russians and the Russian Federation, but they're also important to the furtherance of global security. And I think there are three reasons that that's the case. First, Russia and the United States remain the world's only nuclear superpowers. Together, we control 90% of the nuclear weapons on the face of the Earth. When Russia and the United States are in a period of disagreement, as we are right now, the rest of the world watches warily. 
And for this reason alone, Russia can never be ignored, can never be marginalized. The second reason is that Russia is a major international power. It borders on 15 different countries, three regions, the Middle East, Asia, Europe, whose futures are very tightly tied up with our own national security. Russia maintains a voice and a veto as a permanent member of the uh, UN Security Council. Uh, as such, it is a part of the major decisions that are made on the main issues of the day, the most crucial security challenges we face in the 21st century. Name them, cyber terrorism, uh, nuclear nonproliferation, Iran. Without Russia pulling with us on those, those problems are very, very difficult to solve. If Russia is opposing us on any of those or a myriad of other issues, uh, they're very, very difficult to solve. And the third reason is simple economics. Russia is now the, in the top 10 economies of the world, and it is the second largest producer of oil and gas on Earth. I used to say the first, but that's no longer true. Does anyone know who the number one producer of oil and gas is in the U.S., in, uh, in the world? We are. We overtook Russia in oil and gas about uh, 2012. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But for all of those reasons, Russia matters. And today, almost all of the attention that's being paid to Russia in this country looks backwards to the 2016 presidential elections with a focus on Russian meddling, how much did the Russians interfere, was there collusion, what were their motivations. There is a lot to say on that subject. And it's possible that some things actually haven't been said and haven't been written yet. We'll find out. I'll do my best tonight. I look forward to talking about that and to hearing your views on it as well. But first, I want to take a look at a different upcoming election. I want to take a look at an election that's going to take place in March of 2018 in Russia. And obviously, that's an election where there's no doubt at all that the Russian government is meddling putting its finger on the scales. Now, as the date for that election approaches, it'll be held on March 18th, 2018. I was in uh, Russia just a month ago, and a joke has begun to circulate around Russia already in advance of that election. What is the difference between presidential elections in the United States and presidential elections in Russia? The answer is, in America, everyone knows what the rules of the elections are, but no one knows who's going to win. In Russia, it's just the opposite. <laughs> everyone knows who's going to win, but nobody knows exactly how it's going to happen. Now, the Russians like to say that in every joke, there's a measure of truth. Well, here's a spoiler alert for you. Vladimir Putin is indeed expected to win, to be reelected to a fourth term in 2018. That's not much of a mystery. The real question is, and this is a question being asked not just in the US and Europe, but I found by increasing numbers of people inside of Russia itself, is this. For how much longer will Putin's hold on power in Russia remain inevitable? What are the factors that could weaken him or even lead to an unplanned succession? And what would the result of that unplanned succession be in terms of our own national interests? Would it be good for us, or could it lead to something worse? And what would the effect be on global security as a whole? Those are a few of the issues that I want to try to discuss tonight to help us build something of a broader framework for discussion of U.S.-Russia relations. But any effort to talk about what's coming up with Vladimir Putin in Russia uh, requires us at least to make a brief review of his first three terms. So we'll start with a kind of a brief prologue, recapping his youth and his early professional life. Uh, Putin just turned 65 in October. He was born in 1952 as the only surviving child of working class parents who survived World War II and the Nazi siege of Leningrad, the 900-day blockade. Putin describes himself as a street hooligan in those days, and that's corroborated by a lot of the people who knew him as well. He was a very smart but somewhat unmotivated student who really only found his calling in the intelligence services, which he joined uh, 
after getting a law degree from Leningrad State University in the 1970s. He was posted as a lieutenant colonel to Dresden, to East Germany in the 1980s. And it was there in Dresden that he witnessed from afar the collapse of the Soviet Union, the fall of the Berlin Wall. He returned home to a different country. He left the USSR and returned home to the Russian Federation, and even his hometown had been renamed. Leningrad became St. Petersburg. He joined the city administration, and he rose very quickly through the ranks. Here you see him. We were all staff officers at some point in our lives, and Putin, too, carried the bag for the then mayor of St. Petersburg, Anatoly Sobchak. But he soon was promoted to Moscow where he served as deputy chief of staff to President Boris Yeltsin and later head of the FSB, the successor to the KGB. Now, over the last uh, two decades or so, I probably had about 10 or 12 meetings with Putin in uh, various settings. One of, I think the first meeting I had with him was in Oslo in 1999 when he met with President Clinton at a Middle East peace conference. But a month later, I had a much smaller format meeting with him in Moscow. By then, he was Boris Yeltsin's prime minister. And there were only three of us on the American side of the table at that meeting. And afterwards, we all commented on how self-confident Putin seemed to us. Uh, it turned out there was good reason for that. Unbeknownst to us, at that meeting, December 20th, 1999, earlier in the day, Putin and Yeltsin had met to finalize the terms of Yeltsin's resignation as president. And 10 days later, on January 1st, 2000, Yeltsin resigned as president, and three months later, Putin was elected as his successor. Putin's main focus during his first term, 2000 to 2004, was on restoring order in Russia. The Yeltsin years had begun with a lot of hope for democracy and economic reform, but they ended with a lot of chaotic developments, a lot of crime, and a lot of economic hardship. Two years before Yeltsin became president, most Russians lost their life savings when the ruble crashed. Oligarchs had already amassed small fortunes during the Yeltsin years as the Soviet Union and its economy privatized. Uh, and they were also very deeply involved in political affairs. Putin quickly called them in, quickly called them in for a conference. And something like a new sheriff in town, he laid down the law to the oligarchs. They could keep what they'd made or what they stole during the 1990s, but from now on they had to adhere to two rules. They had to pay their taxes and they had to stay out of politics. And those who tried to cross him either fled the country or were jailed. One of the oligarchs who met with him in that 2000 meeting was a man named Mikhail Khodorkovsky, at the time the richest man in Russia, uh, who ran a, a large oil company called Yukos. Three years after this photo was taken, he was in jail in Russia and served the next 10 years in jail. He was released only in 2014. Meanwhile, in the southernmost province of Russia, in Chechnya, I'm sure many of you remember this, Islamic separatists had been fighting for independence and staging murderous terrorist attacks throughout the Yeltsin years. Yeltsin had tried to quell this insurgency and failed. Putin's crackdown was ruthless and destructive. It led to the death of thousands of civilians, but eventually the terrorists were defeated. I met again for the third time, I guess, with Putin in the summer of 2000. This was in Slovenia. This was the famous meeting with President Bush at which Bush said he had looked into Putin's eyes and gotten a sense of his soul. Bush was roundly criticized for that comment, but the, pom the comment actually paid dividends for him several months later and paid dividends for us as Americans several months later after the 9-11 terrorist attacks. Putin was one of the first, I think the first world leader to call George Bush and or offer his help. He said that he knew the American forces would be going on high alert as a result of the attack and he would stand 
Russian forces down rather than putting them on high alert. And he also overruled all of his, or most of his, military and security advisors, and he gave the green light to America to put bases in Central Asia, basically Russia's backyard, uh, to help us in the fight against Al-Qaeda and the Taliban. But later on, the relationship cooled. Uh, Putin joined with France and Germany in opposing the invasion of Iraq, and his relationship with George Bush grew strained. Putin was reelected to a second term in 2004. He faced only token opposition in that election, and the election was widely criticized for being neither fair nor free. The main fe uh, feature of Putin's second term, 2004 to 2008, was the remarkable reversal of economic fortune that began to reach the pockets of average Russians. Household incomes in Russia between 2000 and 2008 almost tripled because the price of oil during that time almost quadrupled from over, more than quadrupled, from 20 to $80 a barrel. And not surprisingly, Russians' attitudes also improved. Levada is a respected polling agency in Russia which started in the mid-1990s to ask the simple polling question, is our country on the right track or on the wrong track? you can see that in the Yeltsin years, uh, a dominant majority of Russians thought the country was on the wrong track. Those lines crossed as Putin took over, and starting in 2000, uh, then they, there was a bit of uh, oscillation there due to some terrorist attacks that took place, the fighting in Chechnya, but beginning around here, at the same time the price of oil was quadrupling, Russians saw their disposable incomes triple, and Putin's ratings went up above 60 percent. Uh, this, uh, and uh, we'll look at Putin's ratings in a second. These are actually people's attitudes towards the country. Uh, 60 percent of Russians said our country is going in the right direction. And Putin's ratings also made a similar uptick to above 80% where they remain to this day with some oscillations, and we'll talk about those a, a little bit later. But with his population surging and the Russian economy doing very, very well in 2008, Putin faced a problem. The Russian Constitution, which says very clearly that the Russian president is limited to two consecutive terms. Now, there were calls at that time for Putin to amend the Constitution or ignore the Constitution, but Putin chose a third route. He designated his prime minister, Dmitry Medvedev, to run for president in his stead. And with Putin's support, Medvedev won the presidency by a wide margin. Putin became prime minister. They essentially did a job swap. Now, there was little doubt during this four-year some people call it intermission, that uh, Putin was a major power behind the throne, but he did give Medvedev a fair amount of autonomy, especially to run foreign affairs. And this coincided with the period called, that uh, uh, Karen referred to called the reset in U.S.-Russia relations when I was ambassador uh, under President Obama. Now, the reset is often criticized as a failure. But it did produce results that were clearly in our national interests. Uh, Obama and Medvedev signed a nuclear arms reduction treaty which restored joint inspections of our mutual nuclear arsenals and drove the level of nuclear warheads on both sides down. We are still reducing under that treaty today. It has not been abrogated. Uh, Russia also joined with the United States in the United Nations together with the EU uh, and other countries in levying a new round of sanctions against Iran to try to curb their nuclear ambitions. And Russia allowed for the first time the transit of American troops and NATO material across Russian territory into Afghanistan. This was at a time when our ability to supply our troops through Pakistan following the uh, uh, killing of uh, uh, Osama bin Laden uh, was much, much more difficult. 
these were critical lifelines that the Russians opened up to allow us to supply our forces. So the, the problem with uh, resets or periods of detente in U.S.-Russia relations is not that they don't produce results. They usually do. The problem with them is they don't last. And what follows them more often than not is a period of disagreement and rancor not unlike what we're living through right now. Which brings us to the end of this intermission and the start of, well, I guess we could call it Act Three in this uh, drama. Because while the Russian Constitution says there can't be two consecutive terms for a president, it says nothing about non-consecutive terms. So after four years, Putin and Medvedev simply swapped jobs again. But this time, Putin returned as president for a six-year term. They had amended the Constitution. When it was announced that Putin was returning as president, though, the popular response was a bit more muted, a bit less effusive, uh, even negative in some quarters, much more so than it had been before. And commentators in Russia started to talk about a new phenomenon that hadn't been described in Russia before, Putin fatigue. After a parliamentary election that was blatantly falsified, Moscow and St. Petersburg saw some of the largest street demonstrations that they'd ever seen. Many people were carrying signs in these demonstrations that literally said, no to Putin, down with Putin, Putin mu must go. These are the demonstrations that Putin later claimed were inspired by Hillary Clinton to bring him down. Not surprisingly, the demonstrations were followed by something of a crackdown on political protest in Russia, and not always violent crackdowns. Sometimes economic crackdowns can be more effective. There was a law passed in 2014 in the Russian parliament that made participation in an unsanctioned political demonstration in Russia punishable by a fine, a fine equal to a year's salary. That will keep people off the street much better than police with uh, batons. Putin was reelected in 2012 to the term that expires next year. These six years have been among the most contentious and the most controversial of his time in the Kremlin. In 2013, he gave asylum to Edward Snowden, uh, thereby burying any chance of a more cooperative or productive relationship with the Obama administration. Uh, Russian forces were sent in to intervene in the civil war in Syria on the side of Bashar al-Assad. Restoring Russia's military presence in the Middle East, something which they felt a great loss following the collapse of the Soviet Union, and also giving Moscow a say in any eventual peace settlement. As we know, that war is still going on. And most notoriously, Russia annexed Crimea, the primarily Russian, ethnic Russian province of Ukraine. And this was the first change of borders by force in Europe, anywhere in Europe, since the end of World War II. The uh, Crimea invasion was followed by Russian involvement in a separatist movement in southeastern Ukraine, another ethnically Russian part of Ukraine, uh, which has cost over 10,000 lives since it began in 2014 and continues to this day. The response in Europe and the United States to all of this was drastic. We had sanctions targeting key sectors of the Russian economy, in particular state-owned enterprises in the oil and gas sector, and visa restrictions that have prevented some of Putin's closest advisors and confidants from traveling freely to Europe and the United States. The hope was that these sanctions would weaken Russia's economy and cause support for Putin to drop, especially among the elite, among those people uh, who have become fantastically wealthy during Putin's reign. The sanctions have had some effect on Russia's economy. Uh, it uh, has either been in recession or has had very slow and stagnant growth since 2014, although most analysts think the reason for that is more a drop in oil prices than sanctions. But whatever the case, there's still no real evidence that the sanctions have made Putin any more willing to compromise on Ukraine. And as for any weakening in support for Putin among the elite or on the street, this graph tells the story. 
This is the point at which Russia went in and annexed Crimea. Putin's ratings went back up above. This is the period of Putin fatigue that we described. And this is post-Crimea boom, which continues to this day. And our old friend, the right track, wrong track graph shows us exactly the same jump. Since the annexation of Crimea, over 60% of Russia, it has dropped a bit in recent years, uh, think that Russia is moving back in the right direction. Now, this is not to say that uh, Putin is not subject to criticism inside of Russia. I get back there fairly frequently. I think I made three trips this year, and as I mentioned, I was back there just a month ago. And when I go back, I speak to the many, many, many people that I know in Russia, mostly members of the Russian elite, uh, people that I've known in some cases for decades. These are journalists, these are serving diplomats, or people out of government, uh, retired military officers in some cases. And while there is agreement among all of them that Putin has succeeded in, well, let's say, making Russia great again, uh, in the short term, he has succeeded in doing that. Uh, there's also widespread concern among some in the Russian elite that he has made several key mistakes, which in the long run are strategic blunders that are not good for Russia's prospects. The first of these is the annexation of Crimea and support for the separatist movement in the Donbas, that area I showed you earlier. In doing so, he has alienated a majority of the Ukrainian population. This is uh, probably an alienation that will last for uh, as long as a generation. Ukraine and Russia had been bound by centuries of shared history, religion, culture, and trade. Putin's plans to see Russia grow into an economic powerhouse in the region between Europe and China depends on the economic might of Ukraine. And that goal is really unachievable so long as Kiev and Moscow remain at odds. It's a little like uh, the United States gratuitously making an enemy of Canada or of the UK. The second mistake that people point to, strategic mistake, is that Putin reawakened NATO as an adversary. As recently as 2012, NATO was still describing Russia as a potential partner in the fight against global terrorism. Now, NATO forces are being deployed to the Baltic states as a deterrent, and NATO commanders have returned to planning for the possibility of fighting a conventional defensive war against Russia in Europe. This did not happen by any choice of NATO. Uh, as one of my friends told me when I was there a week ago, NATO in European security terms was like a dog dozing by the fire. In 2014, Putin made it sit up and bark. Third, and most worrisome for most of the Russians that I talked to, Putin has showed little desire to reform the economy and begin to wean the country away from that over-dependence on oil and gas that we talked about earlier, its reliance on inefficient state enterprises. In 2004, during Putin's first term as president, income from oil and gas amounted to about 30%, about one-third of federal revenues. By 2014, that figure had risen to 50%, and today it is somewhere around 60%. 60% of federal revenues from Russia come from oil and gas. Uh, that is not a recipe for a competitive economy in the global 21st century. And now many Russians have begun to add a fourth potential strategic blunder to that list, and that's the decision to meddle in the American election during the 2016 presidential vote. Uh, as I said, there's still a lot to be revealed about the full extent of Russian interference, their motivations, the extent of any collusion, but the consequences from this are already pretty clear. At the government level, U.S. and Russian relations have been severely damaged. Anti-Russian sanctions have been written into law in the U.S. Congress. And American popular attitudes toward Russia are the lowest that I can remember since the Cold War. All of this will take many, many years to repair. During my trip to Moscow, I had a long dinner with an old journalist friend of mine who asked me how I thought any of this could be in Russia's long-term strategic interest. I said, really, that's a question that you need to ask yourself. And he just kind of shook his head. 
So there is definitely concern in Russia, despite the 80% approval rating, definitely concern in Russia about where Putin is taking the country, especially among the elite. But that concern is submerged. As we saw, Putin approaches the 2018 elections in many ways at the peak of his popularity. But in a way, calling what will happen in March 2018 an election is something of a misnomer. You have to think of it really more as a, as a plebiscite. It's more like a referendum that's designed to ratify his popularity, much more so than any real competitive election uh, contest in which someone else has an actual chance to win. Still, there will be other candidates, and it's worth talking about them just to give you a, a sense and a flavor of what Russians are preparing for. At the bottom, we have what are called the systemic oppositions. These are the men who run the main nationalist party, the old communist party of Russia, and the economic liberal party. These men have been running against Putin in elections for the last 15 years, and none of them will poll above 5 to 6 percent, but they will maintain representation in the Duma, the Russian parliament, and they will continue to have a job. The more interesting candidate just popped up on the screen about uh, two or three weeks ago. Her name is Ksenia Sobchak, and she is a reality TV star with a tremendous social media following in Russia. <laughs> Some people have called her the Paris Hilton of Russia, but that really isn't fair to Sobchak. She's actually a very intelligent woman, and in fact, in fact, she is the daughter of the mayor of St. Petersburg that you saw Putin carrying the bag behind in the earlier photograph. Now, Ksenia Sobchak, of course, knows she has no chance to win the election. So her pitch to the voters is very simple. When you go to the polls and you want to vote against everyone, there's no longer a box on the Russian ballot that says against everyone. There used to be, but they took it away. She said, think of me as the against everyone box. We'll see how well she does. She is actually uh, being allowed to run in the election. The Kremlin is not terribly distressed because she'll have her participation has the effect of boosting turnout. And the higher the turnout, the more legitimate Putin's inevitable uh, election will seem. The most interesting opposition figure in Russia today is a man you may have heard of named Alexei Navalny. And he will not be a candidate in the election. Uh, because he is someone who could pose a credible threat to Putin down the line. He's a very charismatic politician. He started out actually as a blogger, but uh, he has made a big change in the electoral landscape in Russia. He has awakened the younger generation, high school students, college students who are now involved in politics in numbers that uh, hadn't been seen before. And he's also a fantastic organizer. He has offices in 60 or 65 of Russia's 80 regions. Uh, he will not be running in the election because he was convicted on trumped up charges of embezzlement, which is a felony in the Russian constitution, like ours, it says felons may not run for president. Uh, but he's certainly someone to watch and certainly someone that the Kremlin is watching very, very closely. But a bigger problem for Vladimir Putin lies at the very heart of the system that he has created over these past two decades. It's a system that lacks the institutional or the legal guarantees to guarantee, to guard, to secure the sizable fortunes and the personal faith, not just of Putin himself, but of those men around him in the inner circles in the Kremlin who themselves have grown fantastically wealthy and made many enemies during Putin's reign. All of this argues for some kind of a mechanism that would allow Putin to retain power after his term ends in uh, 20, when it'll be 2024, uh, and continue to perform the essential role of arbiter, of uh, uh, essentially making the decisions between the competing factions inside the Kremlin so that everyone feels that uh, no one else is getting unfair advantage. One of the ideas that's being floated to accomplish this would amount to the creation of a new state organ in Russia, something called the Supreme State Council. After Putin's term ends in 2024, he would be elevated to this new Supreme State Council. Someone else would run for president, but that president would then be answerable to Putin. In essence, it would be uh, 
uh, making Putin something like a ruler for life. Other options are just amend the Constitution to allow him to succeed himself as president. The bottom line here, and it sort of answers the question on the title slide, Putin's final act question mark. The bottom line is that Putin's fourth term is not likely to be his last as ruler of Russia. From everything that I see and I hear and everything that I know about how Russia is ruled and how Russia has always been ruled, we're likely to be ruling, we're likely to be dealing with Vladimir Putin for a very long time, whether we like it or not. With one caveat, born of my long experience as a young diplomat and a budding Sovietologist in the 1980s, during the rise of Mikhail Gorbachev, beware of experts who assure you that nothing will change. So with that as an asterisk, I want to close with some prescriptions. What does this mean for the United States? How do we deal with an authoritarian Vladimir Putin who's not going anywhere anytime soon, who has essentially abandoned the idea of a European vocation for Russia that he espoused at the beginning of his presidency in the early 2000s, and who has been strengthened politically at home by playing the anti-Western and anti-American card? Well, as I've tried to make clear, we're not likely to see a revolt against Putin, either from the street or from within the Russian elite. Our efforts to date to sanction him, to isolate him, to exact a price for his actions, to force him to recalculate his strategy vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine, all of this has had little effect. And in fact, as we saw, it's had the paradoxical effect of actually strengthening Putin at home. Historically, relations between the US and Russia including during the Soviet period, have always been dependent on the relationship between the top leaders, Nixon and Brezhnev, Reagan and Gorbachev, Bill and Boris. <laughs> I, uh, in the 90s, I sat in on many Bill and Boris uh, meetings and phone calls. Uh, obviously, the early relationship between President Bush and uh, President Putin the problem is now the level of mistrust and misunderstanding between the two countries is dangerously high. It's as high as I remember seeing it since the worst days of the Cold War in the mid-1980s. Uh, both governments acknowledge that the tensions are bad and that they need to be improved, but they continue, both Washington and Moscow, continue to blame the other as the sole source of the problem. And really there is blame on both sides. Moscow, for its part, continues stubbornly to underestimate the magnitude of the problem it created by its interference in the election in 2016. It denies any responsibility for what happened and it portrays the whole thing as some sort of internal domestic political fight led by the sore loser Democrats. I heard this more than once on my trip to Moscow a couple of uh, last month and to be fair, uh, our president himself sometimes reinforces that view of Russians inside of Russia. Meanwhile, and uh, this is quite sad for me to report, uh, the Trump administration has lost control of Russia policy to Congress, to a Congress that is deeply divided on just about every issue you can name except Russia, which it exaggerates into a colossal monolithic problem that needs to be punished and punished in the only way that Congress can punish, and that is through sanctions. And as the saying goes, when the only tool you have in your toolbox is a hammer, every problem starts to look like a nail. I wish I could tell you that I saw an early or an easy resolution for this stalemate between the Kremlin and the White House. I don't. But as we discussed earlier, the relationship between these two countries is far, far too important. There's far too much at stake to allow things to spiral downward any further. So what can we do? I believe, frankly, that we need to accept the reality that Trump and Putin are not going to be able to build any kind of close personal relationship in the coming years. That might not be such a bad thing. I am among those who thought that the relationship between the United States and Russia
was far too overpersonalized at the top, the pictures that we saw earlier. Instead, I think we need to focus on strengthening the contacts between us that already exist, the level below the presidents, in areas that are crucial to the security and the important interests of both countries. And to close, I want to talk about what those are. Having given you a bit of diagnosis, my prescription is to work harder in these three areas. The first is contacts between our militaries. The single biggest risk between Russia and the United States today is the risk of an unintentional clash between our militaries. Our air forces are operating in very close quarters, very, very tight airspace above Syria every day. Russia has been buzzing American ships and American aircraft over the Black Sea and in the Baltics. Too close for comfort. Here I have to say there's already some good news. We have, under this administration, established and even grown a cell in which operationally the Russian and American militaries in Syria contact with each other, report on where they are, where they're going, what they're doing. That contact is now beginning to grow and to move up. But more importantly, the heads of our two military establish uh, establishments now are starting to build a closer relationship. Uh, General Dunford, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff in Washington, has had two meetings with his counterpart, General Gerasimov, and they've had numerous phone calls. This is absolutely crucial if, God forbid, we do have some sort of accident in the skies over Syria. Those two men need to have some measure of trust that allows them to pick up the phone and de-escalate the situation immediately. Nothing is more important than that, and we need to do much, much more to institutionalize it. The second of the existing productive contacts that I think we need to spend more time strengthening are business relations. Although the sanctions on the fighting in Ukraine have made it more difficult to operate or to invest in some areas of the Russian economy, especially finance, uh, the oil and gas sector, overall, American companies continue to do business quite successfully in Russia. Citibank, Microsoft, Ernst & Young, International Paper, Ford, Chevron, these are just the biggest of many, over 100 American companies which have been doing business and continue to do business successfully in Russia. American business connections also have the advantage of promoting the right kind of business environment inside of Russia because our firms play by international rules and they reinforce those in Russia who want to play by international rules as well. Despite very strong anti-Western sentiment across Russia right now, Western business is still welcome in Russia. And as, as we've seen, our other contacts are growing much weaker, the business relationship, business contacts can act as something of a shock absorber to help insulate us against the ups and downs that we're going to continue to have in the political relationship. The third crucial area, and I'll close on this point, are contacts between the Russian and American societies. The past 15 years have seen absolutely tremendous growth in links between the cultural, educational, scientific establishments in Russia and the United States. Despite the high volume of anti-Western rhetoric that I talked about, the number of Russian kids applying for visas to come and study in the United States is still at record levels. Whatever differences we have with the Russian leadership, and we will continue to have serious differences with the Russian leadership, it's essential that we maintain and develop the ties with Russian civil society, with its intellectual, scientific community, and cultural institutions. Kremlin control over the country is not monolithic. Russian society remains diverse. And we further our own interests and our desires for positive change in Russia by finding ways to stay engaged with those Russians who want to have good relations with the United States. Relations with the United States are bad in Russia's eyes right now. Most Russians have a negative view of the United States. But if you ask them, do you want good relations with the United States, 75% say, yes, we do. And if you check the number of people in line for visas at the American embassies and consulates across Russia, you'll see another indication.
of how people really feel about the United States. I was having dinner with an old friend, a longtime uh, American observer of Russia in Washington earlier this year, and we were talking about all of this, and he said, you know, we really can't give in to Putin, but we better be sure in the process that we don't give up on Russia. There's a lot of wisdom in, in a kind of short phrase there because there is an internal debate going on inside Russia right now to define their destiny, to define their place in the world. And that's going to continue for decades to come. And I hope that the existential stake that we have in seeing that debate not end in the wrong outcome is self-evident to everyone. I suspect it is. So what's required above all from Americans, especially at this terribly fraught time in our own domestic politics and in the relationship with Russia, is a better understanding. A better understanding of the complex architecture of Russia, the complex uh, processes at work there, and a steady resolve to try to support the processes and the institutions and the individuals in Russia who see their country's future linked up in some more productive relationship with the West and the United States in the world beyond Russia's borders. And if we stay focused on that, then in time I think we'll have to worry less about the temperature of the relationship between the presidents or who is in the succession chain in the Kremlin. I suspect, I think I can say with almost no doubt that the fact that there are so many of you here tonight uh, out on a cold night uh, that you may also share that feeling, and I'm very, very grateful for your attention throughout this lecture. I look forward to hearing your thoughts on what I've had to say now in what for me is the most important and the most interesting part of the evening, the Q&A. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, we're going to try to get to as many uh, questions as possible, so let's try to make them short and pointed. Um, <laughs> Jack, Jack said last night yeah. uh, at the Opera House, uh, oh. a question should end in a question mark. Yeah. There we go. And if students or anyone in the overflow room wants to come in the back and, and ask a question, we'd love that. I see a hand uh, back here. Uh, we've got two microphones on either side, so please raise your hand. Uh, uh, where's the microphone on this side? Uh, there's maybe right here. All right, let's get Okay, great. Uh, thank you so much for your time tonight. And uh, I'm Craig. Uh, as an Iraqi war veteran, I'm from Traverse City, but I served under President Bush and President Obama. Me too. Uh, and, and thank you for but, your but service. Th but uh, you served in a much tougher place than I did. And well, thanks both, for that. I, both men had wonderful you know, pros and cons. Um, at last year, as a civilian, it was harder for me to vote as a civilian and choose, you know, choose my choice. And I, I for the record, did not vote for President Trump. Um, you know, and I, my question to you is, it, it, the material that we get in the media is uh, the main way that we, the, the way that we use that knowledge to choose how we vote. What can you share with us, um, if anything? Uh, what's your opinion about President Trump and the question mark of collusion with Russia or not? I think. Well, let's uh, just get right to the sensitive yeah. issue. Go ahead, John. <laughs> you know, that's uh, that's really kind of not the topic uh, tonight. Uh, I don't I don't want to duck the question. So so let me say this: uh, collusion is something that needs to be proved. We have three investigations going on now in the U.S. Congress, and obviously the Mueller investigation, former FBI Director Mueller. Um, I am confident, I have a lot of faith in the institutions of this country. Uh, I don't think that uh, what we built up over 200 years is in any danger of uh, disintegrating. And so uh, I'm gonna wait for those investigations to conclude and for the results to be published and I think the fact, frankly, that we have three or four different investigations is going to allow us to have a fairly good chance of coming to our own conclusions about how much collusion there was uh, or wasn't. Uh, I will 
uh, say one thing in addition, though, as somebody who uh, lived in Washington for a long time and who dealt with the Russian government uh, through many elections, through the election uh, that brought uh, where President Bush 41 replaced Reagan, um, where uh, Obama was elected. I know that the Russian government, frankly, governments in every country that I served in were always intensely interested in establishing contacts with the candidates, with the campaigns, because their job, the job of uh, the famous, now famous, Ambassador Kislyak, who was Russian ambassador last summer, his job was to reach out and try to find out what Trump and the Trump campaign, Clinton and the Clinton campaign, thought about and were planning to do about Russia. That in and of itself is not collusion, but that somehow, when it gets reported in the media, sometimes gets conflated as something that's almost uh, seditious. It's not. It's simply Ambassador Kislyak out there doing his job in the same way that my job in Moscow was to reach out to Alexei Navalny or the head of the Russian Communist Party to find out where they thought their electoral chances stood. I think it's partly, though, it's being conflated with even today on the news. They're talking about in St. Petersburg, a building where the first floor they're working on the Twitter accounts, the second floor they're working on the memes, the third floor they're working on the blogs. That, that, and, that and, is, that's interference. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, as I said, I think twice, there's no doubt that there was Russian interference in the 2016 election. This is, anyone who says that there's doubt about that uh, isn't paying attention. Uh, whether or not there was collusion between the Trump campaign and the Russian government. Uh, there's maybe evidence out there, uh, but this has to be proven. And I would just uh, hold judgment on that. I think we should all hold judgment on that. A question back here. Um, I have uh, spoken with many uh, clerics that have traveled in Russia and have worked in Eastern Europe. And I am hearing from them that there is a loosening of the strictures on uh, freedom of religion, you know, in the Russian domain. Interesting that it seems like the strictures are coming onto the religious field here in the United States. But what can you comment on that? You know, I mean, typically the the you know the Christian history has been one of a decentralization, and here we've got a centralized government. Can can you make comments on that about whether that's happening? Is that political, politics, sure. or real? Uh, well, let's take a look at Russia historically, uh, religiously. Uh, Russia uh, has been a devoutly Christian country uh, for centuries. Um, after the, the Great Schism uh, between Byzantium and Rome, uh, Russia went east, and the Russian Orthodox Church, a Christian church, uh, became the dominant religious movement in Russia for centuries. After the Bolsheviks took over, they suppressed that with varying degrees of success between 1917 and 1989, 1991, when the Soviet Union fell apart. After that, when Russia uh, became independent and religious freedom was restored in Russia, there was an incredible blossoming of faith in Russia. The Russian Orthodox Church Christianity is not the only religion in Russia. Russia actually recognizes five official religions, Christianity, Judaism, Islam, uh, Buddhism, and Hinduism. But there's no question that Christianity and uh, Russian Orthodox Christianity is the strongest religion in Russia. And by strongest, I mean in terms of adherence and also in terms of political power. Because in the Russian understanding of their state, there is no division between the state and religion. The Russian Orthodox Church is part of the concept of Russian statehood. So after the fall of the Soviet Union, churches which had been closed for decades were reopened and, or rebuilt and Russia really enjoyed a renaissance of faith. And this coincided with the time when there was a great sense of loss in Russia. Russians had felt this loss of the Soviet empire. Their borders shrank to, uh, to uh, frontiers they hadn't seen since the late 1700s. And being able to believe 
being able to go to church became important. It filled a kind of spiritual vacuum that the Bolsheviks had tried unsuccessfully to fill. I don't think that there is a, a crackdown on religion in Russia right now. I don't really see a, a real drive on the part of the Kremlin to go back to a system where the practice of religion was discouraged. What is happening is the Russian Orthodox Church, as the dominant church, sees its market share beginning to dwindle. As it sees other Christian confessions, especially the charismatic Christian confessions, the Protestant confessions, uh, evangelicals, Pentecostalists, who have a much more modern, much more open way of dealing with their parishioners, are winning converts, whereas the Russian Orthodox Church, which is beautiful in its ritual, in its dogma, is somehow trapped in the 17th or the 18th century and doesn't really speak to the modern Russian. The Russian Orthodox Church, the leadership of it, the patriarch are very concerned about that, but the process of reforming and opening up that church, as I think eventually needs to happen and will happen, will take many, many decades. And while uh, that process is underway, the Russian Orthodox Church and the Russian state does tend to tilt the scales a bit against those that they see as somehow threatening Russian Orthodoxy. Question in the back. Uh, North Korea, do you see that as an opportunity for um, an alliance of some sort between Russia and the U.S.? at some level, or is Russia going to use that as a leverage against us? I think uh, it's definitely an opportunity for Russia to do the right thing, to contribute constructively to a problem which, frankly, threatens them as much as it does the United States. Uh, the North Koreans uh, certainly don't have, uh, I think, the intention to attack Russia. I'm not sure they have the intention to attack the United States as well, but as long as they maintain that capability and as long as Russia has a border with North Korea, right here, it's a small border down by Vladivostok, Russia pays a tremendous amount of attention to what's happening because this region of Russia is where most of the wealth of Russia now resides in terms of hydrocarbons and timber, oil, gas, diamonds, it's, it's all here. The problem is that Russia doesn't have a tremendous amount of influence or leverage with North Korea, especially uh, in the Kim Jong-un era. They had much more leverage with his grandfather, Kim Il-sung, uh, who had actually been to Russia many times, I believe possibly even studied in Moscow, if I'm not mistaken, and with his son, Kim Jong-un's father, uh, Kim Jong-il, who also took Russia's views into account. I think uh, Kim Jong-un, the current leadership in North Korea, uh, is most concerned with what Beijing thinks. And Russia's views on denuclearization in North Korea, which it has openly said it favors, is going to be additive to the uh, position taken by Beijing. So I think really when we and the uh, Russians look at North Korea, we see the problem uh, in, in, as the same. We don't see the solution to it in the same way, but our uh, tactics and our strategy really isn't uh, terribly different. Okay, um, question here, but let me just see a show of hands so our people with microphones can kind of come to you. Okay, I see Hal here, okay. All right, and let's take the question here. And All right, I have two questions. questions and you can choose to answer mm -hmm. either one that you wish. Three um, you said you have three questions? Two. Two, okay, then I get to yep. choose the one I wanna answer. Yes. So what kind of concrete evidence is there to suggest that the vote to stay a part of Russia in Crimea was tampered with, unfair or politically unrecognizable, or any other words to describe why the West doesn't recognize it? Was it the little green men or unmarked soldiers? Okay, I'll answer Also, that. why do we support the regime, the regime change in the Middle East in contradiction to Russian actions and strategy, for example, in Syria? We support the rebel forces in a limited way without any significant victories for the rebel factions. This in direct opposition to the government that Russia is supporting. Okay. That's going to be hard to answer because it sound, didn't sound as much like a question. Let me take okay, the first one. 
uh, why was the referendum that took place in Crimea, in which 90% of the residents of Crimea voted in favor of uh, becoming a part of Russia, why was that not legitimate? It is, I think, indisputably a fact that in any fair election, or maybe even an unfair election, a majority of people living in Crimea who were ethnically Russian, who speak Russian, would have voted to join Russia. The problem is the circumstances under which the vote was held. It was held under something of a military occupation, uh, on a small scale, obviously. It took place only weeks after Russian forces, forces had moved in covertly and unseated the legitimately elected government of Crimea, and Crimea, according to international law, was and remains a part of Ukraine. Uh, go back a few years to the vote that took place in Scotland, in Great Britain, when the Scottish people had a referendum about possibly separating from Great Britain. That was an election that was prepared over many years. There were campaigns that were run openly. There were thousands of uh, international, or hundreds of international observers who saw that election. Obviously, the Scottish lost the election, but it was deemed a fair vote. The Russians, frankly, could have done something very similar in Crimea. They could have called for a referendum. They would have had to negotiate that with the Ukrainians, but the Ukrainians themselves realize that uh, there are a lot of Russians living in Crimea. So the way the Russians went about this undermined any legitimacy that they might have been able to claim from the fact that the overriding majority of people in Crimea were happy to join Russia and may still be happy to be a part of Russia. That's really not the issue. The issue is, is that the way we're going to change borders in the 21st century? Where are we? Uh I'm Jod. Oh, back here? Okay. Yeah, um, yeah thank you for coming. You're very interesting. I'm, uh, Good to uh, be back home in Michigan. <laughs> Pardon me? Good to be back home in Michigan. Yeah, it always is. Um, your pictures, uh, you made a point of showing us, uh, telling us how important it is that the head of state for the United States and for Russia, in this case, President Trump and President Putin, uh, are, are strong on a, on a personal basis. Yeah. Um, President Trump just returned after meeting with President Putin. Um, I personally have a little bit of a concern uh, when I hear President Trump basically say, the way I can understand it, that uh, President Putin said that there was no Russian involvement in our election, and I guess that's the way it is, so let's move on. And I know this is kind of a subjective question, but being an expert at international relations, uh, what strengths can you tell us moving forward that President Trump has in that area? Thank you. Well, that's kind of a variant of the, the first question, I think. Uh, I think when I was talking about the relationship at the top, historically, uh, in U.S.-Soviet, U.S.-Russia relations, uh, I tried to make the point that it has gotten, in some cases, over-personalized. The relationship between uh, Clinton and Yeltsin paid some dividends for us, but the fact that uh, they were so close made it difficult when Yeltsin began to decline. He got sick for the last three or four years of his term uh, before Putin took over. Uh, it took away a very important channel that we had over-relied on. So what I'm trying to say is I do, the fact that it's going to be difficult for a number of reasons, the um, investigations that we've referred to being a, a main part of that, for many reasons it'll be hard for Trump and Putin to develop that kind of personal relationship. But maybe that's not such a bad thing because it doesn't all depend on what's happening at the top. We have these relationships now at lower levels that we need to nurture and we need to grow. And those can help carry the weight of the relationship uh, while things get sorted out at the top. And John, are you happy with, uh, in terms of those lower relationships, uh, in terms of the State Department staffing and filling out positions when it comes to Russian relations, can you comment on that? How, how are we doing? We're not doing well. No, I'm not happy about that at all. Uh, the State Department is undergoing 
uh, a crisis of staffing and a crisis of confidence unlike anything I saw during my 30 years as a Foreign Service officer. Uh, and I'm very, very concerned and disheartened about it. Uh, since January of this year in the State Department, we've lost 60% of our four-star generals. In the State Department, we have ranks that correspond to military ranks. Career ambassador is a four-star. I retired as a three-star, uh, which is called, what, career minister, two-star minister counselor, one-star counselor. We've lost 60% of our career ambassadors since January. We've lost 35% of our career ministers, my rank, uh, three stars, since January. Uh, the two-star and one-star ranks are also being depleted very, very quickly. This is happening because people are not being promoted. It's happening because people are retiring early because they don't feel that their work is valued. Why don't they feel their work is valued? I'll give you a good example. I was insulted earlier this week, or last week, when President Trump was asked about these vacancies, jobs that have gone unfilled in the State Department. He, he said he doesn't worry about it, those unfilled jobs because I'm, he said, I'm the only one who matters. The people that I work with in the State Department, my colleagues, are subjected to that kind of treatment and that kind of dismissal almost on a daily or weekly basis. With all due respect to the president, when an American businessman in Asia calls the embassy because he discovers his business partner has taken all of the proceeds and put them in an offshore account, essentially stolen the business out from under him, it's not the president who calls the prime minister and protests. When, when an American student studying abroad dies in a car accident, it's not President Trump who has to call the parents. I've had to do those things. And for someone to suggest that all of that work somehow just isn't important, doesn't really matter, uh, is an insult to our entire country. We need a strong diplomatic establishment. We need to be bringing people into the Foreign Service just as we need to keep bringing lieutenants into the military. Uh, if we don't do that, we are removing one of the best and, I think, strongest tools we have in our own national security toolbox to advance our own interests. Sorry if I got a little emotional there. Uh, thank you. Uh, take that applause and find a way to project it uh, to Washington, please. I think this question is probably related to that. Um, I believe in your I believe in your prescription. Um, uh, my mother and her family ran away from Russia uh, because of an autocrat, and uh, my daughter, our daughter, was one of the first CIA employees to meet with the KGB after the fall of the Soviet Union. We've been, and we were recently in Russia. Uh, in my lifetime, I've seen some pretty autocratic people, like Mao Zedong, uh, like uh, Hitler, uh, like Stalin. And as I look at this situation, you know, I'm wondering if what we aren't watching between Putin and Trump is a really a playing out of their themes of their lives with us at the expense with, and the Russians at the expense of that. And I believe about talking person to person, but when I was in Russia recently, a woman in, a, in one of their markets said to me, hey, American, what do you think about Putin? And I said, I soft pedal that whole thing. And I said, you know, he's a very smart man. He seems to be cautious when he makes decisions. He's rational. And she said, what? You're crazy. He's crazy. <laughs> so. I guess the point is, what do you think about? Are we playing out the themes of two people's lives? You said Putin wants to make Russia great again. I hear Trump saying he wants to make America great again. Whose lives are we playing out? And how does, how does anybody manage the personalities of leaders like that when the two countries that are as important as they are? That's my question. How do you manage that? Who do you well, manage that's, that? Well, that's why I think, uh, in a way, we're kind of making a virtue out of a necessity here. Uh, 
it's going to be very difficult. For Trump and Putin really don't have a close personal relationship now. They've met once in uh, Germany for a uh, little over an hour, had a conversation at a dinner afterwards. Uh, at the APEC meeting in Vietnam, they only really shook hands and exchanged uh, words uh, in a hallway. And there is no agreed agenda at the presidential level between the two of them to work off of. Uh, in my experience, when the presidents would meet in the past, when Obama would be, meet with Putin, when uh, Yeltsin and Clinton would meet, we would prepare for months ahead of time, talking to our Russian counterparts at our level about what we might be able to tee up in terms of an agreement that we've been trying to reach, whether it was on business or the nuclear side or, or the environment. And the meeting between the presidents was not a meeting at which they thrashed out the details of that agreement. The agreement essentially had been agreed ahead of time, 95%, by the lower levels in the State Department, in the military, with their Russian counterparts, the presidents would meet and they would essentially bless that. Or they would do the last 5% of the negotiation, what's the number of the arms, uh, nuclear arms reduction going to be, uh, 1,500 or 1,750. Uh, we're not anywhere near that point in the relationship between Trump and Putin now, but I think the relationship itself potentially has enough strength beneath them that the fact that they cannot get together, that they really don't have the kind of relationship that we saw before, isn't uh, a negative factor. And I think, as I said, there are enough important things going on in the relationship, I didn't, didn't even mention space, uh, where Russian and American astronauts and cosmonauts for the last 10 years running have been essentially operating the International Space Station through all the ups and downs of the U.S.-Russia relationship. So there, there's a lot of maturity that has uh, established itself, I think, over the last 15, 20 years, and, and we need to try to rely more on that at a time when it's just not possible to have a relationship at the top like we got used to. Well, I, we're in uncharted territory. Only God yeah. can manage that. Um, <laughs> Amjad, do you have a... Uh, okay, Hal Gurian right here. Yeah. Thank you very much. I think your talk tonight was just outstanding. Thanks. Uh, a question on Syria. Mm -hmm. Russia right now is very influential there, and Bashar looks like he will be staying. Mm -hmm. Do you think when uh, Obama was urged to have a no-fly zone in Syria and also urged to support this, the uh, anti-Bashar regime and he refused to help support these people, a vacuum was created and the Russia then moved in. Uh, I'm not really sure that we created a vacuum that Russia filled. Why, why did Russia go in to Syria in the first place? Russia's intervention in Syria is a function of Vladimir Putin's intense and unwavering opposition to regime change and state collapse, especially in the Middle East. When Vladimir Putin looks at the United States over the past 20 years, he points to a number of countries in which American-led regime change, in his view, has not led to a better environment, starting with Yugoslavia and Kosovo and moving to uh, Saddam Hussein in Iraq, Syria, uh, rather, sorry, Libya, uh, Gaddafi, uh, Iraq, Saddam Hussein. And Putin's and the Kremlin's view on Syria is formed first and foremost by that aversion to any kind of regime change because in their view, and this is not wholly wrong, what follows regime change sometimes is worse than what was there before. Russia is also in Syria supporting a very longtime ally and client, and Russia has lost a lot of standing in the Middle East since the collapse of the Soviet Union. They used to be one of the main players in the Middle East peace process. Putin, as part of his goal to reestablish Russia's seat at the head table internationally, wants to be a decider and a player in Syria. Uh, Syria, frankly, also now has become 
the territory for a kind of semi-permanent military presence by Russia in the Middle East. Uh, the naval facility at Tartus is being expanded so that larger ships can berth there, and they've built the equivalent of an air force base in, in uh, Assad-controlled territory. So Russia's view on Syria is very much tied up with the view of America as uh, a troublemaker that needs to be stopped, and about Russia's own desire to reestablish its own territory in uh, the Middle East, uh, its own base, a foothold. As long as ISIS was active in Syria, as long as we and the Russians had a common en enemy, it was easy for us to reconcile the differences that we had because we could focus on the fact that we were both fighting ISIS. Well, now ISIS is virtually defeated. And without that common enemy, the differences that America and Russia have on the future of Syria are coming much more uh, uh, into sight now. It's a little bit, reminds me a little bit of what happened in World War II. We were uh, ideologically about the biggest rivals that we could be, and yet we put all that aside to fight against a common foe, Hitler. And after the defeat of Nazi Germany, then the differences between Russia, between the Soviet Union and the United States grew into the Cold War and the break that we all remember. Right, and John, would you, so we can finish on that note, can you, uh, for three minutes, we have gone over, and I apologize, I lost Nuts. track of time, but will you talk about your father, and uh, so we can leave with that uh, thought in mind? Well, I'm always happy to, to uh, let me just say a very quick word, because you did say some things about him at the I did say it very coherently. Please, you start over. Uh, my dad is considered to be the only American soldier in World War II who fought both in the American and the Russian armies against Hitler. He, like me, was born and raised in Muskegon, Michigan. He joined the army after Pearl Harbor, and he joined the paratroopers, 101st Airborne, and jumped into Normandy the night before D-Day, June 6, 1944. He was captured by the Germans several days after that, and he spent the next six months in a succession of prison camps. He, was, uh, he escaped twice, he was recaptured twice. Uh, after his second escape, he was returned to a German prison camp which was actually on the border between what is now Poland and Germany. And uh, the Russians in January of 1945 were advancing closer and closer to that position. He again escaped, from the camp and hearing Russian cannon ran east in the direction of the Russians and actually linked up with a Russian tank unit. He spoke a little bit of Russian and he had a pack of Lucky Strike cigarettes, very, <laughs> very lucky for him. And he convinced the commander of the tank unit that he was a, an escaped American prisoner of war and they wanted to send him back behind the lines and he said, no, I haven't had a chance to fight the Germans. They've been holding me prisoner and mistreating me for the last six months, let me at him. You had to know my dad to know what a crazy thing that was. And they actually allowed him, they gave him a machine gun and put him on the bank of a Russian tank advancing towards Berlin. He advanced with them for about uh, a week to 10 days and then he was severely wounded. He was uh, evacuated to a Russian field hospital where he recuperated for a couple of months where one day he met up with Marshal Zhukov, who was the supreme commander, kind of the Eisenhower of the Russian forces. Zhukov heard about this uh, American paratrooper who'd been fighting in the Russian army, came up to talk to him through an interpreter, and my dad said, I'm not gonna be able to fight with you to Berlin, I'm too banged up, can I get a letter or a passport or something to go to the American embassy in Moscow and get home? Uh, Zhukov gave him a letter with that letter, my dad was able to travel by train and truck convoy from Poland to Moscow, where he arrived in February of 1945. He was dropped off at the American Embassy. Unfortunately, they took that magic Zhukov letter away from him. I looked for that letter in the archive for decades and never found it. Uh, and when he gave his name, rank, and serial number at the U.S. Embassy in Moscow, they checked with Washington and found out that he had been erroneously reported killed in action 10 days after D-Day, six months earlier. A funeral mass had already been held in his name in Muskegon, Michigan, and his parents had gotten a telegram informing them that he'd been killed in action. 
So it took several days to clear up this misunderstanding, but eventually it did happen, and he was repatriated to the U.S., and he actually celebrated VE Day 1945 in Chicago. Uh, when I went to Moscow as deputy chief of mission, before I became ambassador, I was deputy ambassador, uh, my dad made a trip back to Moscow, and by that time, his story as one of the few, if not only, Americans who had fought with the Russians against the Germans was very well known. Uh, he was interviewed. He was actually given uh, a ceremonial Kalashnikov rifle by General Kalashnikov himself on stage. And together, we watched the parade on, uh, across Red Square on May 9th. Uh, the fact that my dad when I became, my dad died that same year in 2004, I became ambassador in 2008, but the fact that my dad had fought against the Germans with the Russians in World War II opened the do many doors for me as an ambassador and helped me be more effective than I might have been without him. So, thanks, Dad. The power of people. Thank you, thank you so much. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. And thank you. Well, John, would you agree now that you'll come back in two or three years and update us? Yes. Yeah, I, I hope I don't need to come back sooner. Okay, right. And then for all the students out there, again, just to emphasize that you don't have to go to Harvard, you don't have to go to an Ivy League school. You can pursue a passion wherever you are, whether it starts at Muskegon Community College or NMC or Grand Valley. It doesn't, you can do that. Yeah. So that is the other lesson from tonight. It, I say this, I, I, meet, I meet with students, I mentor students all the time. It doesn't matter where you go, it matters what you do when you get there. Yeah. Thank you all so much. Thank you.